Hello everybody, I'm here. I apologize for the delay on this video, but, you know, personal life, busy, busy, work, busy, busy, so uh, that really had to stifle uh, my ability to uh, actually do this video, but I'm here now. A uh, lot of stuff to talk about, namely SummerSlam and the fallout of SummerSlam that occurred on Raw this week. Uh, before I get into that, a couple of quick things. Um, I said I was going to see Expendables 3 and Ninja Turtles and give movie reviews of both. I ended up not seeing Expendables 3, uh, just ran out of time, but I did see Ninja Turtles. Uh, to give my quick thoughts on it, it it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, and it was probably better than, say, Ninja Turtles 3, so it's not the worst Ninja Turtles movie ever made, but it's still not good, and it succumbs to a lot of the Michael Bay problems, where it's just action scene on top of action scene on top of action scene with not a whole lot of development in the story, and the story itself doesn't make much sense, and the acting's not very good. Uh, Will Arnett is probably the worst actor in the movie. Um, in a movie that includes Megan Fox, Will Arnett, who I like, and I typically think is funny, is it, it, just downright... He has so many jokes that fall flat here. It's really sad to see, actually. But, um... Yeah, it's... It's just not very good. It's just a very soulless movie, and it's kind of a a shitty version of the 1990 live-action movie that I grew up watching. It was actually the first movie I ever saw in movie theaters. Uh, I remember I was five years old and just I saw a commercial for it, and I was just like, Dad, I, I need to see that. It's like, I, I basically, I was just like, Mommy, Daddy, Mommy, Daddy, Ninja Turtles. I, I, I can't even properly verbalize how much I want to see this movie. Just know, I really want to see this movie, and I was so happy when I did. But this movie kind of plays out sort of like that, but in a really shitty way. And just, it has no heart, it has no soul. It's just kind of, just a bunch of action scenes on top of each other in a story that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And the the best thing about the movie are some of the interactions with the turtles. Uh, some of those are good and capture the spirit and the character that we expect from a Ninja Turtles movie, but those moments are few and far between. And it doesn't help that the turtles look absolutely hideous <laughs> in this movie, which has been commented on regularly by many, but the turtles do not look good. Who designed those fucking things? They look awful. But anyway, uh, yeah, th that's my thoughts on the new Ninja Turtles movie. It's not the worst thing ever, but you're probably better served just going to see Guardians of the Galaxy again, which is, in a lot of ways, a better Ninja Turtles movie than the Ninja Turtles movie. But, um, you know, take that as you will. Uh, but yeah, getting out of movies and back into wrestling, um, TNA can't seem to catch a break. I heard Davey Richards broke his leg, and I heard Bubba Ray might be leaving the company, which, you know, when it rains, it pours for TNA, although, uh, their TV deal has been extended till the end of the year, so, you know, that's three more months, or, or what, two more months of, uh, yeah, it expended, there, I think the current deal, or, the old deal they had would have expen expired, there we go, in October, and they've been extended to the end of the year. I don't know the exact dates or whatever, but basically, for the rest of 2014, we have TNA on Spike TV. Where they go from there, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, we got Bound for Glory coming up, and I have absolutely no idea what the card's going to be, but... You know, does, does anybody really care at this point? It's, it's hard to care. Um, uh, anyway, NXT, want to talk about that. Uh, Adrian Neville and Tyler Breeze had their championship match on the last episode. And I wanted to comment on that because I really wanted to see that match because I wanted to see Breeze win the title. And I thought they were going to save it for their next big special in September. Uh, I think it's called TakeOver 2. Um... So I was surprised that they did the championship match uh, on last week's NXT, and I was like, uh-oh. And I didn't watch the show until Saturday, so I just had it in my head. as like, uh-oh, I guess Breeze lost, because I, I think if there was a title change, I would have heard something, uh, you know, because that, that stuff can stay, can only stay unspoiled for so long. So I just imagined, like, oh, geez, Breeze probably lost. Um, but no, he didn't. Uh, he, uh, the match ended in a disqualification, so it was really, you know, nobody lost, really. Uh, so Breeze still basically stays unbeaten. Um, and, and that's good for him and for his development. Um, and the match itself was very, very good. I mean, very, very, very good, and just really highlighted all the strengths of both guys. Neville, no one will ever accuse Neville of being a great talker, I don't think, 
But at the, uh, in the same breath, they will never accuse him of being a shitty worker either. He typically gets really good matches out of the guys he's working with, and Breeze has just been phenomenal, uh, both as a character and as a worker. And I like the Goldberg run that he's kind of been on where he'll hit the beauty shot after the first, you know, the match will be going for 30 seconds and he'll hit the beauty shot quickly and end it. Uh, I think he's become a more dangerous character. And uh, Yeah, I was really looking forward to that one-on-one -on -one title match at TakeOver 2, but I guess we're not getting it. It looks like it's going to be a four-way, and I've heard that that's what they're going to do. It's going to be a four-way with Neville, Breeze, Sami Zayn, and Tyson Kidd, which I'm kind of... Eh, I mean, it'll be a really good match, but if they're going to do a big title change like Breeze winning the belt... I typically prefer it to be in singles matches, and they should really only do multi-man matches for belts if they do a, an excellent job of setting up every single contender. And Tyson Kidd just doesn't feel like he belongs there as a character because he lost all of his matches against Neville, and then he turned heel, and he hasn't been any more successful than he was before. I... Mean, I um... You know, I can't... He, he loses more than he wins, so to me, he shouldn't be in line for a title shot. But there's that, you know, wrestling trope that's popped up over the last few years where, you know, all you have to do is turn heel and act like a dick and you get a title shot. Does that make any sense? Not really. Not, <laughs> not if you're trying to emulate a sports league. It doesn't make any sense at all. But um, I would have liked for them to get a few more wins under Tyson Kidd's belt before they, uh, you know, put him back in the title picture. But... Um, I'm sure the match will be fine. It'll be really good, and I would hope that Breeze would win, but um, that's one of those, we'll see how it all plays out. And I think uh, with NXT getting guys like Prince Devitt and Kevin Steen and Kenta, um, we're going to see a pretty good influx of talent going into the show. So I think it's going to be uh, really, really good for the future. It seems like Neville's going to get called up soon, and the Ascension's going to get called up, and um, I, I still like the tag team tournament that they're doing, and uh, I think that should be lead to uh, a nice end to the Ascension's run because they've kind of been the Brock Lesnar of NXT's tag team division where they just win in dominant fashion. And again, I'm going to get into SummerSlam, but uh, they, you know, they've got something good there with them and they can set up a good ending uh, at the next show. And I, I think Charlotte might get called up soon, too. So I wouldn't be surprised if Bailey won. Um, uh, the NXT Women's Title, which I would never problem with, because I kind of like Bailey. She's got this happy personality that's kind of infectious, and I kind of like her. So, um, yeah, some good things going on on NXT, and an excellent match between Neville and uh, uh, Tyler Breeze. That was a fantastic title match. I just had to talk about that. But let's go into SummerSlam and Raw. And I normally don't like to do a pay-per-view review the night of the pay-per-view or the next night. I usually like to wait until Raw happens so I can get a full scope of the direction and what they're doing. And that's typically been my M.O., but unfortunately that that decision led to this video being put off until the end of the week. But, uh, you know, hey, you, you know, you live by the sword, die by the sword, I guess. Uh, but uh, I, I will say that SummerSlam overall was pretty good. Um, not a fantastic show. I don't think there were any matches on the card that I would consider a quote-unquote match of the year candidate or anything like that. But as a solidly booked, action-packed show from start to finish, it wasn't bad. It was, it was pretty solid throughout. And, um, let's just jump right into it. And I'll throw my feelings for Raw in, uh, as it ties into SummerSlam and just kind of knock both out at once. So, uh, with that, let's get started. The pre-show match was RVD versus Cesaro. Solid match. I still want to know what the hell Cesaro did wrong. What did he do to deserve being de-pushed like this? Because coming out of WrestleMania 30, we all thought he was going to be one of their next big projects and was going to be, you know, they put him with Heyman, uh, they gave him the Andre the Giant Battle Royal win at WrestleMania, and it just felt like the sky was the limit for him, and then it amounted to nothing, and here he is, he's jobbing to... RVD on the pre-show. It just feels like, what What the hell did Cesaro do wrong? I, It's one of those weird things. You know, he was getting over. His matches have been really good. I, I'm not saying he should be world champion. I'm just saying you got nothing for him besides Jobber? Okay, I, that's a weird decision, but sure. Um, I mean, really, if you look at the winners coming out of WrestleMania, he's the only one that they don't have a plan for. Daniel Bryan... I mean, this was supposed to be his year. Unfortunately, uh, the neck injury pretty much prevented that. 
Um, the S.H.I.E.L.D. have been, you know, even though the S.H.I.E.L.D. is broken up, the individual members have been a major fixture of the show since then. Um, and they were before that anyway, so, uh, yeah. Uh, who else won at WrestleMania? I'm trying to remember. John Cena, who will be there until the end of time, uh, it seems. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember the WrestleMania card. That's amazing, but, uh, that I've already forgotten so much of it. Uh, do, 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 do. No, nope, mine is blank. Oh, AJ, uh, she's been in the big feud with Paige uh, for the Divas division. So really, I mean, Cesaro is the only WrestleMania winner that they had no plan for at this point in the year. It's it's really where naturally Swagger has found himself into a bigger position on the show, even though Cesaro actually defeated Swagger on Raw this week. But it's really more, at not so much to give Cesaro a push, but more to keep Swagger's story going and whatever they're ultimately going to do with that. So, um, you know, Cesaro might just go right back to jobbing next week. We'll, we'll see, but it's just amazing that he started, he came out of WrestleMania so hot and now they have nothing for him. And it just, I have to ask the question, what did he do wrong? Nothing that I could see, but I'm not there behind the scenes. So who knows? They took Heyman away from him with no explanation. Uh, none given on TV anyway. I, I, I think I saw an interview somewhere where Heyman was in character and he explained that because Brock Lesnar was coming in for SummerSlam, he had to focus all of his attention on Brock Lesnar, so he, he had to let Cesaro go, but they never really... That sounds like it, that sounds like Heyman making that up himself and not something that the writers gave him. It's just kind of, well, well, fuck you. If you're not going to explain it, I will, but... Anyway, uh, our video Cesaro was a solid pre-show match. I just don't understand why Cesaro is the one losing. I, I, I don't get it. And why they have no direction for him. I, just, I don't understand. Anyway, getting into the main card. You get, we started off with Ziggler versus Miz for the Intercontinental title, which was a good match and had a nice ending as Ziggler actually won the title, which was surprising. Um, and a good surprise, because it's like, oh, yay, Ziggler, you're actually doing something with him. Yay! Uh, after, what, like, a year and a half of being just thrown through the meat grinder? I mean, it's been an ugly... Ever since he dropped the world title, it's just been ugly for him. So, But he, was, he remained over. The fans loved him uh, in spite of that. So it's nice to see that get at least somewhat rewarded, whether or not they're able to make the Intercontinental title in, into anything going forward. We'll just have to wait and see. But um, one thing I will say, uh, while this match was good, and it was a good match, and I do like that they're making something out of the knee injury for Dolph, and they could probably turn that into an I quit match at the next pay-per-view or, or something. I'm just throwing ideas out there. But um, I didn't. I, not that I didn't like the finish, I felt like they could have done a better finish. There was a spot in the match where Ziggler went to kick Miz in the face, and Miz, doing his whole, like, oh, I'm a Hollywood superstar and my face can't be heard because I'm the pretty boy or whatever, covered up his face, and then Ziggler rolled him up for a two count. I think that should have been the finish. And I'm actually going to do another video about this, how I don't think that small packages and roll-ups and other, you know, backslides and all of that stuff, how I don't think those are weak endings to matches like a lot of smart marks do. Um, I think those can be good finishes if you do them really well, and they actually make sense within the structure of what this sport of wrestling is supposed to be about. And um, I don't know. I think by doing by if they had made that the finish, and it actually would have played well into the knee injury if they had saved it for the end, because Ziggler would have looked helpless, and then you know tries to get in a lucky shot, and Miz covers up to protect his oh so handsome face. And then that leaves him exposed, and Dolph is able to roll him up for the shock victory and able to persevere past the injury, which I think would have fit in perfectly. But um, it would have worked perfectly for Miz's character that his heel character trait is that uh, nobody can harm my face. My face is just perfect, and it, that's how I make my money and how I make my fame, and nobody can harm my face. It would have been perfect if he had, you know, letting his vain nature get in the way if he had covered up his face and then Ziggler had rolled him up for the surprise uh, three count, I think, you know, his, um, the thing that makes him a heel and, you know, gets him his heat would have ultimately been his downfall. And I think that would have been a good finish to the match. But that's how I, my brain normally works. I normally think, all right, what makes sense for the characters and what, how can we set up the fall for the heel if we're going to do the title change? But uh, that's just the weird way my brain works. I just, when Ziggler won the belt, it's like, oh, they should have had the finish be that roll-up when Miz tried to cover his face. That would have been great. But 
Um, anyway, it was a good match. It was a good Intercontinental title match. And like I said, I'm going to elaborate on the roll-up thing uh, in a future video. Actually, my next video. So that'll, that'll hopefully spark some interesting discussion. And hopefully uh, you won't think I'm too crazy. But anyway, uh, next match was Paige versus AJ Lee for the Divas title. Good match. It was much better than the match they had last month at Battleground. It was a little short, and the ending was a little abrupt. But it was a solid match, and Paige played her character very, very well this time. This is the first time I've watched Paige in a match where she's um, conveyed some kind of a personality and a character. And, you know, things like crawling on top of AJ and, like, pulling her hair and just being all weird and creepy. I mean, that's the type of stuff that I expected from Paige when she was first brought to the main roster. Because, like I said, I didn't see any of her NXT stuff. And that, considering the type of hype that was surrounding her, I expected something like this. And I think we're getting more of that. And I thought the finish was great, even if it was, a, again, a little abrupt. Um, I like that she countered the Black Widow into that DDT. They had a name for it that was really cool, but it, it's escaping me at the moment. And I thought that was just a really good counter and set up the win for Paige. And, you know, yeah, it actually came off well. This is the best Paige has done since she's been with the company. And um, so good job there. Uh, the flag match was also good, uh, Jack Swagger versus Rusev. My fear was is that it was going to be like a capture the flag type of match. And I mentioned this in my preview where they were going to do something where Swagger, all he has to do to win is grab a flag off of a pole and he beats Rusev, but not really. And that's their way to give a feel-good win without actually having Rusev get beat. And it's just this kind of namby-pamby bullshit type of way of doing it. I like that they kept it just a regular match with the winner getting the spoils of being able to hoist up their flag and have their national anthem played. That makes more sense to me. It's like, look, if you're going to get that type of, you know, that victory that means so much to you, you know, fucking earn it. Don't just, you know, play a kid game of capture the flag with each other, you know. And uh, um, actually, when they started brawling early on and Rusev got hurt, I thought they were going to call it a no contest and then Swagger was just going to wave the flag and they weren't going to do the match. And that was going to be their bullshit way of getting Rusev out of there without actually getting beat. But no, they didn't. They actually played the match. Rusev sold the injury, and there were various points of that match where it was like, oh my god, Swagger could actually win. And uh, he didn't. Rusev ultimately fought through the injury and won. But, you know, I wasn't necessarily favoring one guy over the other when I talked about in my preview um, how having Rusev lose that way would be weak or whatever. I, I wasn't saying one guy should win over the other. What I was saying is that, look, if you want Swagger to be a big baby face, give him the win. If you want Rusev to stay a monster heel, give him the win. Just pick one and go with it and uh, let the storylines that follow, you know, write the storylines to follow up on that going forward. Um, and ultimately they went with Rusev. My one knock on the finish is that they did the bit where he was so hurt with the pain that he couldn't lock in the accolade, which was great. And that was perfect, and it gave Swagger, like, his window to get out of there and possibly win the match. But then later, he's able to lock it in fully after suffering more damage to his ankle when, when the Patriot lock was locked on. And I was like, ah, that's a little... It's like, whoa. So, I, I, I mean, I guess the pain numbs up after a while, but still, it seemed weird that more damage was inflicted and yet he was now all of a sudden able to lock in the accolade but uh, other than that i thought it was a good match it was just a good uh just a good showcase for both guys and rusev got the win which builds more heat on him and continues his run his undefeated run and uh building heel heat on him and it looks like swagger is has some character development where he's legitimately disappointed in himself for losing on behalf of his country where they go from there we'll just have to wait and see if they just do a losing streak thing with it i think that would be kind of weak but, um, you know, they could probably give Swagger some good character development coming out of that. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, if you're able to make his character stronger for it, more power to you. Um, next up was the Lumberjack match. Dean Ambrose versus Seth Rollins. And, oh, yes, I am going to talk about that match from Raw this week and what they should do with Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose going forward. The Lumberjack match itself, um, I've said that I don't like that gimmick. I've never liked that gimmick. It's never worked for me. Um, I did like this match, though, and it was probably the match of the night. Uh, Rollins and Ambrose just have this natural chemistry and the storyline, and the feud's been built so well. And they're such good workers on their own that it just it was just a natural, naturally exciting match. And 
basically Ambrose going out there and just saying, fuck this gimmick that I picked, and uh, basically destroying the format of the Lumberjack match while also incorporating the Lumberjacks in various spots, which kind of settled into a mini Royal Rumble there for a minute. Uh, it made for a very chaotic and fun match, and uh, Rollins got the win, which was good for him. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, overall, it was just a really entertaining and fun match. Now, the next na night on Raw, they did their fan voting gimmick, which was one of the laziest ones they've ever done, where it's like, all right, fans, you get to vote for a no-holds-barred match, a no-disqualifications match, or a falls-count-anywhere match, all of which are almost exactly the same. I mean, the differences between those three are minute at best. And actually, I, in my mind, no DQ and no-holds-barred are the exact same thing. So, really, the only difference is, is you know, falls-count-anywhere, you can pin the guy anywhere. That's really the only difference between the three gimmicks. So that one, that was extremely lazy. However, the match they had on Raw was exactly the match I pictured um, when I heard they were going to be having a match at SummerSlam, and that's the match I wanted at SummerSlam. And they went out there on Monday Night Raw and had one of the most exciting, wild, hardcore matches I've seen in a long time, and one of my favorite matches of the year. It was outstanding. I loved it. It captured everything I loved about the feud, everything I loved about both characters. It was creative. It was exciting. It was, um, it, it was just a really, really fun match to watch. Very exciting. And I really wanted Ambrose to beat him. And that was that's the key to the story, is that I want Ambrose to get his revenge on Rollins. And that's uh, why the feud works so well, is that you have this asshole that broke up the S.H.I.E.L.D., which I have not seen the S.H.I.E.L.D. documentary on the network it, uh, yet, but I fully plan on watching it, because I've heard it's really good, and when I saw the preview for it, I, I knew I had to check it out anyway. So I will get around to watching that. But um, that match they had on Raw was absolutely outstanding, and in my opinion, that match was better than anything on SummerSlam. And, and like I said, SummerSlam was a good show, but that match on Raw was just outstanding. I loved every minute of it. It was beautiful. And, and uh, the ending was great, because Rollins curb-stomped uh, Ambrose into the... The cinder blocks, the little, you know, cinder block display that Kane had there and uh, set up an injury angle where Ambrose refused medical attention and has since disappeared, even though he's off filming a movie. Um, it leaves me wondering, where is Ambrose, how long is he going to be gone? Like, uh, you know, and what's going to happen when he comes back? The idea that I have. And this is just me throwing ideas out there. Now that Lesnar is the WWE champion, and again, I'm going to get into that in a little bit, um, he's going to be working a part-time schedule. He probably will not be working Hell in a Cell in October. If I had to guess, he probably will not be working that pay-per-view. Um, you have right now the hottest feud in the company, Rollins and Ambrose. It's a great feud. They have history. Uh, both characters are great. Both workers are great. Uh, the match they had on Raw was absolutely outstanding and makes me want to see more. You have an injury angle to milk it and to build it for even longer. Um, I say give them the Hell in a Cell match at Hell in a Cell and let them main event. Let them close out the pay-per-view because I guarantee you if they had had that match on Raw at SummerSlam, they would have stolen the show and nothing else could have followed it. <laughs> <laughs> because it was that good of a match. Like, it would have probably killed the rest of the show <laughs> because nothing else would have even come close to matching it. And uh, I think that there's plenty of room to do Hell in a Cell with those two. And if they do get the Hell in a Cell match and Lesnar's not working that pay-per-view, which is very likely, I say give them the closing spot. Give them the main, give them the main event and let them show that a, this feud is awesome, and B, both guys were able to do it. And you, you know, you have the Money in the Bank briefcase winner, who theoretically should be set up to be a future main eventer anyway, a, you know, future world heavyweight champion. And let's go back to just having great grudge matches close out pay per views, because that's something that's really gone to the wayside. Because there's just this this mindset of just having a world title match at every single pay per view. Like there was no reason to do that four way last month at Battleground because we all knew Cena was going to win, and nobody gave a shit. <laughs> nobody cared. Um, and I think scaling back on title matches and allowing these grudge matches to kind of get the spotlight it helps you create more stars and actually vary up your pay per views a little bit without you know spamming matches over and over and over and over again. 
Um, one example that I go to is that they let Savage and DDP close a couple of pay-per-views in WCW in 97 because, you know, they were building up to Hogan and Sting and they were keeping Hogan... Uh, they were keeping Hogan's title matches to a minimum and Sting was not wrestling at all. So, to fill the void, they had Savage and DDP, which was a great feud. They had great matches and they went out there and had really good, you know, closing matches for their pay-per-views. So, it worked. And... Um, they might not have done the buy rate of Sting and Hogan at Starcade, but it was a nice uh, placeholder for a pay-per-view main event, especially if you're doing one pay-per-view a month. I mean, it was a nice placeholder to kind of change things up a bit, freshen it up, and then save for the bigger pay-per-views when you do the title matches. So it's really, there's a lot of benefit to doing that, and quite honestly, I think Ambrose and Rollins, it's the best feud in the company anyway, and they deserve the main event spot. Um, you know, and Hell in a Cell, it's a gimmick that's totally warranted from this feud. And so many times in Hell in a Cell matches in recent memory, they've done feuds and storylines that do not warrant Hell in a Cell. Ryback and Punk did not warrant Hell in a Cell. Uh, Sheamus and Orton did not warrant Hell in a Cell. And, uh, you know, it, it will, I think it would help rejuvenate Hell in a Cell if they actually let Rollins and Ambrose close out the pay-per-view and let, and obviously let them be the only Hell in a Cell match. That's another point I have to make. That needs to be the only Hell in a Cell match on the card. None of this bullshit where they do two or three. That's, no, just one, and let it be Ambrose and Rollins. And I think that would be beneficial all around. But, uh, the Lumberjack match was good. The Raw match was even better and actually one of my favorite matches that I've seen this year. Probably a top five. I, it was outstanding. I just loved it. It was it was fantastic. And everything that I wanted out of a match between those two, except for a winner, which, again, the door's been left open for them to do an ultimate burn-off match. So, hell in a cell. Let's, let's hope. That's their big chance to do it. Um, anyway... Uh, moving on from there, I think the next match was... What was after that? I don't remember. Was it... It was Bray Wyatt and Jericho, I think. Okay. I, I'm just going to assume that was next. Um, Bray Wyatt and Jericho. Better than the match they had last month, and at least Bray got the win, and hopefully they're able to give him some kind of a direction going forward, but... Because uh, they've really been struggling with him ever since the feud with Cena. Um, it's funny how that works. <laughs> but um, it, it's still... The match was just kind of okay. It wasn't great. Um, it, again, it was better than the last match they had. But it still kind of had that start and stop kind of flow to it that didn't really... It just didn't really click with me. It was just kind of an okay match. It wasn't anything that great, though. Um, I, I don't know if the two just don't have great chemistry or what the deal is, but it just didn't work for me. But uh, it, it was still an okay match, and at least Bray went over. Uh, next we got Stephanie McMahon versus Brie Bella, which a lot of the naysayers said that this match was going to be a disaster. I defended it because I thought they did a really good job building the match up on TV. And like I said, if you can get people to believe that, you know, two people want to beat the shit out of each other, then half the work's done right there. And they went out there, and quite honestly, I thought it was a good match. It wasn't spectacular, it wasn't great, but, you know, for the feud that they were doing, and, you know, they went out there and just had a good, solid match. Steph looked good in there, at least. And, of course, she's, uh, you know, into weight training and all sorts of other things, so uh, she was probably in really good shape for it. And I loved uh, all the little spots they did, like Bree drop-kicking Triple H and Triple H overselling it like a boss. And uh, that was It was just a good, fun match. And there was nothing, uh, not a whole lot bad to say about it, except for maybe the ending, which once Nikki went out there, we kind of, at least in my mind, I was like, well, there's your ending right there. Um, I think we all kind of thought that a Nikki heel turn was not necessarily predictable, but it was something that was in the cards and we kind of knew that it was in the card, so when they got around to pulling the trigger, we all just kind of figured we would see it coming. And sure enough, that's pretty much what happened. Um, I, I can't say that a, a Bella Twins feud is going to excite me all that much, but whatever. Uh, the match itself was solid, and it you know it wasn't the disaster that people thought it was going to be. So it was it was good. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, next up was Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns, and. Uh, Mm. They got some work to do with Roman Reigns. I still like Roman Reigns. I'm not going to shit on him. What I'm going to say is that they're booking him too much in that Sheamus or Cena type of way where he wins in these really formulaic matches and his moveset is getting very repetitive and it's 
you know, I mean, that's going to, the fans are going to turn on him. And sure enough, they kind of did a little bit in this match. You kind of hear fans not going along with Roman Reigns in, in this match. And I think this is a guy that's, you know, got a great look, has, you know, is a great athlete and can do really cool things in the ring. And I would be booking him more like a Goldberg type, where he's a monster that wins in dominant fashion, but he does it with different moves in every match. And that's the thing about Goldberg's streak that a lot of people forget about, is that, yeah, they all ended Spear Jackhammer, but he would throw in, like, a pump handle slam, or he would throw in, like, some kind of an MMA takedown or something. He would throw new moves out there to kind of... Um, keep the matches fresh, but also create the illusion that he's this unbeatable force that has that can beat you in all sorts of different ways, and you can't really prepare for him. That's I would probably be doing more that with Roman Reigns, and right because right now he's getting too formulaic. He has to do the drop kick outside the ring with you know with the opponent roped over the second rope. He has to do the Superman punch. He has to do the spear, and really I would be. To me, I would, um, unless it's like WrestleMania or some special occasion, I would never do the Superman punch and the spear in the same match. I would have him win with one or the other and then use them interchangeably. So that way, especially the Superman punch, because to me that should be a move that should come out of nowhere. It shouldn't be, you know, an overly set up move. I think it would be much cooler if it was more of like a surprise move. But, uh, you know, and it really makes no sense because now he's doing this thing where he sets up, he does the Superman punch, and then he waits for his opponent to get back up to set up the spear. To me, that's... First of all, that doesn't make any sense, logically, why you would punch a dude in the face and knock him out and then wait for him to get back up just so you can spear him. That's not a... And again, I, I can kind of get that they want to go for like a Hogan three punches, boot, and a leg drop, or a rock a rock bottom people's elbow, or a spear jackhammer type of thing. But the transition from from Superman punch to spear just isn't very natural, and that's not the way you want to be, you, you want to go about doing it. Now, if you wanted to do a Samoan drop, and use that to set up the spear, or the Superman punch, or something like that, I, I guess, I don't know, I'm just... Uh, basically doing the Superman punch and then the spear and all the time it takes to set both up, it just doesn't feel very natural. And, um, you know, Reigns, he still dresses like he's in the Shield, he still has the Shield's theme music, and the Shield is dead. And normally, the partner that winds up with the tag team look and theme music normally is the one that doesn't make it, i.e. I Marty Jannetty. And, uh, well, I guess, well, there's also Bret Hart, who kept all the Hart Foundation stuff, so maybe I'm wrong. But it just feels like he should kind of develop in his own thing, into his own thing, like Rollins has and like Ambrose has. Because right now he's just kind of like, he's, it feels like he's acting like he's still in the, sh he's still in the shield when he's not. Uh, the group no longer exists. But, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying this match was terrible. It wasn't an awful match. It just... I can kind of see some of the signs with Roman Reigns and the crowd kind of turning on him, and they, they need to work on that, especially if he's going to be the guy that they put up against Lesnar. I mean, that's they need to work on that. I think that this match with Orton probably could have been cut in half in terms of time and, uh, you know, do a better job of working around Roman Reigns and uh, getting him to... Uh, you know, getting him into the position he needs to be before they pull the trigger and make a world champion out of him. So, uh, hopefully they're able to fix those things. And, uh, you know, we, we're not seeing a situation where most of the crowd is booing Roman Reigns. But, um, that'll take us into the main event. John Cena versus Brock Lesnar. <laughs> or, or, as I like to call it, the most hilarious match ever. Because I, I don't know about you people... I enjoyed the holy hell out of it because I watched John Cena get completely fucking destroyed for the entire match and then get beat fucking clean. It was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. Oh, it was beautiful. Just beautiful. I loved every second of it. Um, but it was really legitimately surprising to see that happen, too. And it, it really does establish Lesnar as a monster because far too often when the WWE tries to push a monster... They have him beat up some guys on TV, maybe win a match or two, but then come pay-per-view time, they lose. How many times did they do that with Kane? How many times did they do that with Big Show? 
You can't tell me he's a monster and then have him lose all the time. That's just not, it doesn't make any sense. But now Lesnar's a guy, he beat Undertaker at WrestleMania, and now he took Superman, uh, John Cena, and absolutely obliterated him. It was, it was shocking, to say the least. And, okay, he's a monster now. You have firmly established him as a monster. Good job. That's good booking. Um, and now Lesnar seems so dangerous, and now, um, you know, whoever ultimately beats him, you know, that's a huge feather in the cap, and you will ma hopefully make a big star in the process. Um, so, yeah, I don't have a problem with the match being booked the way that it was. Uh, you know, maybe doing 18 or however many it was. It felt like 30. German suplex has got a little repetitive. Actually, Spoonie on uh, Noah Antweiler uh, on Twitter had a great line where he said, it's like SummerSlam, more like Oktoberfest with all these Germans everywhere, you know. Um, and it got a little repetitive, and it got to the point where I was just like, man, is he trying to break Scott Steiner's record? His, Scott Steiner's belly-to-belly -belly suplex record? Man, that's crazy. Um... But, uh, of course, Brock doing the Undertaker setup, I thought that was hilarious. But uh, what the match really, what made it so shocking is that I knew Lesnar was going to win, and nothing really happened to convince me that that wasn't going to happen. But I kept waiting for Cena to have that big Superman comeback of his with the five moves of doom. Was that the second match he's had with Lesnar where he didn't do the five moves of doom, which makes me wonder if... Lesnar just doesn't want to take that crap or whatever. I don't know because the five moves of Doom are... I, I've gone... I've talked about it before how the five moves of Doom that Cena does are just fucking stupid. But, um... And anybody that takes it, it makes him look like an idiot. But, uh... Uh... You know, I kept waiting for Cena to just make this awesome comeback. And he had a couple hope spots. And he had one brief flurry, but other than that, he got demolished. And it was it was legitimately shocking. He ended Undertaker's streak, and he squashed the seemingly unbeatable John Cena. That is some great, you know, credibility to put onto a character like Brock Lesnar. Now, um, I am not happy that they're doing a rematch at Night of Champions because, in my mind, Lesnar's dates are limited. And that's just a waste of one of his pay-per-view matches to do it again. And, uh, all right, we're looking at this, Night of Champions. If Lesnar wins, you just told the same story again, so nothing was accomplished, and it, you just did the same main event. Whatever, it's nothing special. Um, if it's a competitive match, you diminish what you did at SummerSlam um, without getting anything out of it in between. It's like, yeah, all right, Cena gets demolished one month, and then he goes out the next month, and it's 50-50, and it kind of diminishes that accomplishment a little bit. Um... And if Cena wins, it just fucks the whole thing up altogether. So to me, there's not a whole lot of upside of doing this match. And if Seth cashes in the money in the bank, it's kind of... I feel like that would be doing that too soon. Because um, I think they can actually get some mileage out of Lesnar as champion. Namely, um... I, I, and again, I've talked about this. The good thing about Lesnar being a part-time guy is that the world title matches will be a lot fewer, so they'll be more special when they actually happen. And like I talked about with Ambrose and Rollins, you have a situation where you can have grudge matches and big contenders matches, headline pay-per-views. And, you know, go back, it makes the world title mean more, and it ultimately elevates other guys and give them moments to shine. And, uh, you know, it's ultimately, it's, it's, yeah, I think it would just make each pay-per-view give it its own identity and make it more interesting and make world title matches be more special in the process. And, you know, it puts more heat on Lesnar because, you know, the whole mindset of every WWE character is that they have to be on the show all the time. John Cena, I'm here every night, I work every show, and blah, 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 blah. And it puts more heat on Lesnar. Now that he's the champion, you, you know... He's not there all the time, and it's kind of like John Cena's worst nightmare in a way that the guy who's a part-timer and uh, doesn't really love the company or doesn't really love the profession, he just does it to make money, um, has the belt and he's not going to be defending it as often. So it actually, by not having Lesnar on TV defending the belt all the time, it creates fewer opportunities to get title shots, which makes those contenders matches mean even more. So getting into that number one contender spot is going to be very hard because Lesnar's dates are going to be limited. and um, So it'll make getting into that world title spot even harder to do and make it mean more when somebody actually breaks through and gets there. Now, 
is it going to be Roman Reigns that ultimately dethrones Lesnar? Because I think a lot of us are assuming it's going to be Lesnar versus whoever uh, at WrestleMania 31 and dropping the belt. Uh, is it going to be Roman Reigns? Is it going to be returning Daniel Bryan? I could actually foresee a situation where Dean Ambrose kind of surprises everybody because he's really the most overface in the company right now. Am I, am I wrong to say that he's the most overface in the company? Because Daniel Bryan's hurt. And Cena's always going to get that 50-50 reaction. As far as live crowd reactions, it feels to me like Ambrose is the most overface in the company. And they could potentially get him into a situation where he could get a title shot against Lesnar and people would probably buy it. Because he's, uh, I think he's developed well. And I think he's developed better than Roman Reigns. And like I said, Reigns, they've got some work to do with him. Um... So we could potentially see a situation where Ambrose leapfrogs Roman Reigns. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part, or maybe I'm just being a fanboy for Ambrose, but, um, you know, they, they have their options come WrestleMania 31. That's all I'm going to say. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. And hopefully, you know, Cena does not win the belt back at Night of Champions because that would just be a waste of the entire thing. But uh, that is all I have for now. Like I said, I do have another video planned very soon. Um, regarding uh, roll-ups and backslides and small packages and why I don't think those are bad finishes to matches. Uh, hopefully you all find that interesting. Hopefully you all found this video interesting. But uh, yeah, that's all I have for now. Y'all enjoy your weekend and peace out, everybody.